sir. No, it's no, fine. No. Oh. You're white on blue. Hi. I'm Robert McBride. This is not Carlos Calmar. <laughs> but I'll tell you something. This man stood in for me right here a few weeks ago when I showed up late one day. This is Peter Frajola, the associate concertmaster of the Oregon Symphony. Hello. Hello. Thank you all. And continue coming in. Find a seat. We're really glad that you're here on such a cold night. Not quite stormy as we thought it would be, but not yet anyway. Yeah, though Thank on the way coming. here, I saw a couple of cars with thick layers of snow on them, so they must have come down from the hills somewhere. Did you know that this is available? This is next season's information, so you can get this at the customer service table in the lobby. Some wonderful things coming up next season. I just saw this for the first time a few minutes ago, so great things that I didn't know about and I'm very excited about. But Peter and I are going to talk more about what's coming up tonight. And you may be interested to know that both of Peter's parents played violin in the Oregon Symphony. And Peter, like 35 years now? My 35th year. In this orchestra. Applause, please. I love that. Well, I love both parts of that, that, you did, that you're doing the same thing that both of your parents did, and you've been doing it for so long, and you are connected. I guess. Uh, my, my dad played violin. He was the music, direct, uh, music uh, orchestra teacher, conductor teacher down in the public schools in Salem, and my mom taught private lessons at the house. And uh, my dad ended up playing in the orchestra here I think roughly mid-60s through the mid-70s. My mom got in and he and, uh, he and she overlapped by a few years. She was in the orchestra for 30 years and she and I overlapped by 19 years. And uh, so I'm sort of the end of the line at this point for the Frijolas. <laughs> <laughs> what a long, wonderful tradition it's been. That must have been really nice having your mom on the stage, though it meant you had to behave all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, she's, uh, she was back there watching all the time. But I think she was very proud of me, and I was very proud of her for having a job like this, being able to play in this group for so long also. Uh, it's an amazing orchestra. I'll always say that. It's, it's my favorite orchestra. I listened to it when I was growing up as a kid. When my dad would come up for concerts, he'd bring me up, and I would you know, sit in the audience. But it was in, over in the Civic, what we used to call the Civic. And I loved sitting over there and kind of waving to him when he came on stage. That was, was like really, really something to me. You know? And I, I grew up listening to this orchestra. It's still my favorite orchestra. Great orchestra. I'm going to move a little bit. Ordinarily, Peter sits in this chair uh, here as associate concertmaster. Sarah Quack sits here, concertmaster. This person in an orchestra is the conductor's right-hand man or woman, despite the fact that he or she is at the conductor's left hand, that doesn't matter. And the associate concertmaster is the concertmaster's right-hand person. And there's also an assistant concertmaster. So what do all these different concertmaster persons do other than play the violin beautifully? Well, I just... I, I sit there and I try to play the violin beautifully. That's number one. But we always have to help the conductor when he looks like he's trying to go faster. We try to help move the group along when he tries to go slower, if it's louder or softer. Whatever he's thinking, we have to try to amplify that, try to help him get that message across in real time, just immediately, as immediately as possible. And sometimes we know what's coming because we might write it in our music from our rehearsals. Sometimes it's spur of the moment on stage, something changes in a concert. Maybe one person does a little something and Carlos follows him. We have to follow Carlos, who's following him. Uh, it just kind of goes down the line that way. It, and uh, there are other jobs there also. We have to bow the parts. The concert master for a particular show will bow put bowings in the music, like a down bow looks like an upside down paper clip, or staple. An up bow looks like a V above the note. So up bow, down bow, so we mark those markings in the music so everybody in that section 
looks like they're playing together, hopefully is, but at least looks like it. So she doesn't have to do all that herself. You help her with all those little pencil things. Well, when she's concert master, she puts the Boeings in. Uh -huh. Concert master, I do. When Aaron is concert master for certain shows, she does. So, so in all of the parts for all the strings? No, for the first violins. And then they take our part and pass them to Chen. Uh -huh. And then Nancy and Joel, or in this case, Charles this year, and goes down the line and everybody agrees with, you know, is it the best they can with what the concert master is doing. By the way, I read that we have Felix Mendelssohn to thank for the concept of all the strings bowing together. Before that, it was just everybody did whatever they wanted to do. You'll still see them do that sometimes for a particular effect if the composer or the conductor wants something really loud and maybe a little fuzzy, then you'll all get to do what you want to do, which is fun to watch. But it's also fun to watch when you really are a precision instrument as one. And as a string player, you all have to do that. You're not like, you know, the, the principal flute who plays her own thing. So you, you're part of a team. Teamwork is really important. How is that talked about within the sections? Or do you just assume that and you don't have to talk about it? Well, we pretty much assume that. It's, it's something that we've grown accustomed to doing, that we're taught to do that from junior high school orchestra or middle school at this, at this point. Uh, we're brought up to make sure that we try to get the same bowings, that even sometimes the same fingerings, or at least on the same string, which string we're playing on mm -hmm. for a particular timbre. Um, sometimes, like Robert says, the, uh, the, the bowings are, are, look different because they are different. Maybe the front half of the section has one bowing or one part, and the inside has a completely different part with completely different bowings, different timing and everything. So you can see a lot of times very different things happening within a section. Uh, but it's still supposed to be rather uniform. Sometimes there is a particular reason, like you said, for blurring where the bow changes happen, where we just want a wash of a sound for a certain amount of time. And so everybody's supposed to change the bow randomly. So that's kind of fun. Over the time, over the years that Carlos Kalmar has been the music director here, he has really transformed the string sound. It is so beautiful now. How does that happen? Well, he has a very, a very large vocabulary of what he asks us to do. How he asks us some analogies once in a while, you know, no, this should sound like water rushing down the hill or whatever. I mean, he comes up with many different analogies that kind of give us a mental picture that helps. Uh, sometimes it's just softer, louder, faster, slower. But most of the time he's trying to give us a, a, a bit of a mental picture or an, an idea. Um, and he comes up with a, a lot of different uh, ways of making different sounds like close to the bridge, away from the bridge, maybe changing an up bow to a down bow for an attack. It's easier to, to attack on a down bow, so we usually reserve those for hard attacks. No, heart attack, hard attacks. Uh, uh, that came out weird. Um, and the, the up bow is a little softer start, so we might start certain things up bow if we need it to be very quiet. But yeah, he has a, a huge vocabulary and, and he's gotten us to play with a lot of different styles. He also grew up in Vienna, so he knows the Viennese style. He knows Germanic styles, he knows Italian styles, he knows American music. He's amazing, he's, he's a Hoover vacuum. He just soaks everything up so fast. He, he, he's learned so much music in just one lifetime. It's really amazing. Mm. And I love playing for him. He's, uh, he, He's really wonderful conductor and music director. That's really nice to hear you say. And he used to play the violin, so that probably doesn't hurt when he's communicating to all you string players. So tonight's program, the Symphony Number no. 1 by Prokofiev, which he called his classical symphony, which has some very high string stuff in it. Violin Concerto by Aram Kachaturian, with a wonderful Dutch violinist who's coming for her fourth 
visit here already, and then Dvorak's wonderful Eighth Symphony after intermission. So Prokofiev classical symphony. The idea was, he thought, hmm, if Joseph Haydn were around now, which was early, around the time of the First World War, what, what sort of symphony might he write? That was the idea he had in mind. So it's, it's short, light, a little cheeky, a lot of fun, and it's... It's a lot of work. Yeah, it's deceptive because it's so fun to listen to, but it's not fun to play. Well, it's not easy to play. It's, it's fun to play, but it's really difficult. It's so touchy. We have to just be you know, lightning quick about our changes of dynamics and register. We go up high, low, high, low, just all the time. Everything's changing. He never sits still for very long. But what's really neat about this classical symphony, you kind of touched on it, it is a classical format of a symphony where the first movement is what we call a sonata allegro form, and I don't want to bore you with too much musicology, but the sonata allegro form has a, uh, a first section um, where he exposes the themes, it's an exposition, he, he states the themes, usually a first theme and a second theme, then he goes to a development where he the second section, where he plays with certain themes and develops them, makes little changes, whatever. And then he finally gets back to a recapitulation, a third section in that first movement. And it's very typical of what they did with the classical symphonies. Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven, they almost all used a sonata allegro form for the first movement. Uh, and he follows that very, you know, very exactingly. It's, it's, really, it's really exactly like a, a, a real classical symphony would be. Except instead of being, you know, 20, 30 minutes of a Haydn or Beethoven symphony, in this case it's 15, maybe 13. And I bet if you watch right as Carlos gets the downbeat and check your watch again afterwards, it might be more like 10 or 12 minutes. He takes it so fast and it's just, it's really difficult, but it's really exciting. I was checking out a performance of this piece on YouTube yesterday and I was reading I don't remember now who it was, what the, who the orchestra was. Duh. But anyway, and so I was reading some people's comments about it, and th about that performance, and one of them said, the flutists gave up during the finale. Rest in peace. <laughs> <laughs> Ow. Yeah, but it really is tricky, 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 but it's so fun to it listen fun. to. The, the first and fourth movements are very fast, and the second and third are much more peaceful and serene and not, you know, not, really, not nearly as difficult, but they're still difficult. They're not quite as difficult. The second movement is uh, the Gavotte. Is that the, the Gavotte movement, I think? And it's very nice, kind of like an older, pre-classical, more of a, a Baroque um, style of, of writing, Gavotte. Bach wrote a lot of Gavottes. There were a lot of Gavottes in the uh, uh, Baroque period. The third movement is, um, uh, it's not exactly a minuet. It's sort of a, it's like a minuet, but it's in, in four. And it's, in this case, it's supposed to be, well, Carlos gave us some really good cues on this one. He said it's supposed to be like a really big guy coming in to a bar and he kind of has a few drinks and then it starts getting really wobbly. And at one point you can hear the bassoon player uh, purposely kind of going, butt up, kind of like, whatever. Uh, and, and then it just kind of like, it's like he just kind of gets, he's had enough and he just wanders out the door and it's over. And so that, that's what we're supposed to try to play the <laughs> movement like. Great, just great vivid picture for him. And then the fourth movement is just ridiculously fast and very fun. Right. That's Prokofiev Classical Symphony. Then the Violin Concerto by Aram Khachaturian. He was younger, but he and Prokofiev were both composers in the Soviet Union during the Soviet era, and they were both chastised by the Soviet musical, musicological junta, as Peter Shickley likes to say. And, but they're very, they're very different composers. Uh, Kachaturian was Armenian and loved folk music of Armenia and, and Georgia and, and other places in that part of the world and used that a lot. And when he was teaching, he encouraged his students to do that as well, to 
listen to the stuff that the people create spontaneously and bring that into the concert hall and show us what you can do with it. So you'll definitely hear that in this concerto, which was written in 1940. You've played this piece before, I assume. Did you ever play the solo part? I've never played the solo part. It's, it's a long concerto. It's very difficult. You just have to have a lot of stamina, and I've, I've never quite gotten around to... to uh, telling myself, I'm going to do this piece. I'm, gonna, I'm really going to knuckle down and, and really learn it. Uh, but it is a really fun piece to accompany, and especially for me sitting right there, I get to just look up at the soloist and see what she's doing, what kind of fingerings, how her bow arm works. I mean, there's so many different things that she's doing that are just amazing. She's such a great violinist, and I know you'll appreciate her. Uh, it's like a master class for me to just sit there and listen to her and watch her. And I, I feel very fortunate to have the ability to be that close. And if any of you see a few empty seats down here up front, maybe come down and grab one for that, because it's, it's really amazing. Uh, you did mention that, uh, that he was chastised, uh, Kutch Train was chastised for being a formalist, and in fact, he was also dubbed anti-people. And yet, he wrote folk music. He, he loved the folk music from that whole area, not just Georgia, uh, Near East, Far East, Central Europe, he loved folk music, and yet the the powers that be dubbed them, uh, dubbed, dubbed him and Prokofiev, and of course Shostakovich as anti-people, and it just kind of makes me wonder what they were listening to. <laughs> I, I, Stalin, who knows? I don't know what he was listening to. Yeah, yeah political machinations, who knows? You have been a soloist in concertos. Which ones? When I was in high school, I got to play the first movement of the Mendelssohn Violin Concerto. Uh, that was with this orchestra, and it was... When you were in high school? When I was in high school. Uh, I won the Corbett competition, which was something that the symphony held every year, and the, solo, uh, the, the winner would become a soloist, like on a youth concert. And it was one of those once-in-a-lifetime moments for me to, to really remember that. And I think at that point, both my mom and dad were in the orchestra, so we were all three on stage <laughs> one day. Wow. <laughs> uh, and then I've done a numerous different solos, but just a few concertos with this orchestra also. Yay. You mentioned the terrific front row seat that you have when there's a great violinist here to play with us, as Simone de Lamsma certainly is. I really enjoy watching the faces of the string players when they're not having to play. Like the cadenza in the first movement of this concerto is outrageous. <laughs> I can't believe that anybody could play that. And you're going to get to watch her. And then on those occasions when the soloist plays an encore, then all these players are just looking at them. Just taking it in. Yeah. It's fun to watch. Uh, she didn't play an encore last night. We played in Salem. And I can certainly forgive her because this piece is 30-some minutes long. It's a long concerto. And it's very exhausting. And I can imagine she walks off stage and she's, she's done. <laughs> but who knows? Maybe, maybe if it was a different program you know, with a, a shorter second half or something, maybe she would play an encore. I don't know. Well, she won't be completely done because she will be signing autographs at the table in the lobby that has all the CDs piled on it. Her recordings and Oregon Symphony recordings, Carlos Calmer recordings, all those good things. Then there's halftime. You can have a drink. Read your program notes if you haven't gotten around to it before then. They're, they're always interesting and helpful. And then Antonin Dvorak's wonderful Symphony Number no. 8 which is so beautiful and so heartfelt, and again grows out of the soil this time of Bohemia, they called it back then. The, and then it was Czechoslovakia, and now it's the Czech Republic. But that beautiful, beautiful part of the world, which Dvorak loved so much. And while he lived in Prague some of the time, and while he lived in New York City for a little while, it was his country home that he really loved, which is still in the family. I would love to go there someday and see where he used to hang out. And this is almost like, 
it's almost like Beethoven's pastoral symphony. You have this sense of, 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 of country life and, and a connection to things that are real and, and nature-filled. I just love it. And do you love to play this as much as I love to hear it? I, I think so, yeah. Uh, there are, th his last three symphonies, certainly the seventh, eighth, and ninth, are, are very well known. They're very often played, especially the eighth and ninth. The seventh is, is really neat. Just, it's one of the first pieces that Carlos ever conducted when he came here. And so I have just really great memories of that also. But this piece, the, the eighth, the G major, is very warm. It's just uh, a lot of, like you say, great folk music. Great writing, it's uh, neat violin parts. There's places where he asks the horns to kind of, turn, I think they're supposed to turn their horns upward and they're kind of blaring away just for like a second or two at a time and it's really exciting. Uh, it starts off with the cellos playing in E minor even though it's in G major. So he uses the relative minor if you get, want to get a little wonky about it. But he starts off with the cellos playing this kind of somber melody. And then all of a sudden, the sun, the sun comes out and the flute plays the first main theme. And it's just like, oh, it's just so beautiful. And uh, the, oh God, I'm trying to think which movement is which. The third movement is almost like a little bit of a slower furiante, one of the Czech dances that he loved to, to write. Uh, where instead of, you know, we're basically in three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, but he writes one and two and three and one and two and three. And so it's, it's sort of stretching that three into two bars. Each group of three becomes two bars. And he uses that in this third movement. It's just very cool how he does that. He did that in his Slavonic dances. He did that in probably a few other symphonies, and this is, is just absolutely gorgeous. The fourth movement is really raucous and just a great way to end the concert. I've always had the impression that Dvorak is one of those important composers to Carlos. And I've never actually asked him that question, but he's conducted a fair amount of Dvorak here and does it with such panache and such joy. Has he ever said anything to you about what his most beloved composers are, anything like that? You know, I, I really don't know where his particular, um, I don't know. I, I'm not sure, you know, what his favorite composers are. Let's just put it that way. Uh, I do know that every time we play something with him, it just seems like that's the piece. That's the piece right now that he's concentrating on. That's his favorite composer, his favorite piece. And he knows how to just bring it to life. He, and he does with Dvorak. Like I say, it was one of the first pieces that he ever conducted, the seventh, with us. And so I tend to associate Dvorak with him, even though we used to play the eighth and ninth with De Priest all the time. He loved the Dvorak eighth and ninth symphonies. And yet Carlos has sort of made those his own with this orchestra, I think. 35 seasons with this orchestra. <laughs> yeah. About time. How many more do you have in you? I'd like to make it through this season. <laughs> start with that. Okay, I won't push you any farther than that. It's a, been a pleasure talking with you, Peter. I've known you for My a pleasure. long time. Uh, we went through the phase together when your hair was too short. It was you, you. You just have such great classical music hair. You know, I'm really glad that you're finally letting us see that. And you remember the time where I could pull on it? It was long enough back there where I could pull on it real easily. I don't remember that. Oh. You went from one extreme to the other? A couple times, yeah. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> that was then. This is now. You're going to love this concert. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you all for coming. Yeah, really Peter Fragiola. Robert McBride. <laughs> <laughs>